Wild Israel journeys to the country's southernmost region to explore two worlds. One, a clear tropical sea teeming with life. The other, a landscape of red granite mountains and harsh desert. Welcome to the Red Sea and the Eilat Mountains range. A place where every animal needs serious survival tactics. Some rely on camouflage. Others prefer to hide. The lucky few have developed lethal defense strategies. Some manage alone, and some need partners to stay alive. In Israel, history is everywhere. Religion and culture have intersected over the centuries. But the country is less known for its fascinating wildlife and terrain. Explore in Israel most people never see. From snowy peaks to the world's lowest sea. From Mediterranean beaches to lush waterfalls and ancient desert landscapes. And from green mountains to colorful coral reefs surrounded by desert mountain ranges. At the intersection of Israel, Egypt, Jordan, and Saudi Arabia lies the Gulf of Eilat at the northernmost tip of the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean. Fifteen miles wide and 5,900 feet deep. The Gulf's water is crystal clear and seductively warm. Water temperatures hover at 75 degrees Fahrenheit, even though the temperature rises above 113 degrees Fahrenheit on dry land. The clarity, depth, and steady temperature have brought to life the northernmost coral reef on the planet. Densely packed together, How do all these creatures survive in this underwater jungle? Welcome to a world where cooperation is the key to staying alive. The coral reef is one of the largest natural structures built by living creatures. It comprises thousands of tiny building units called polyps. The polyps are able to move their tentacles in the water. They secrete calcium carbonate and gradually build the colony's skeleton. But the corals require assistance to build their hard limestone skeleton. That assistance comes from their partnership with microscopic unicellular algae. These algae live in the inner cell layer of the coral. Using photosynthesis, they generate and provide the coral with oxygen and most of its energy requirements. They also speed up the processes of building the coral skeleton. Both partners benefit from this relationship. 
The algae can thrive in a comfortable, protected habitat. The coral gets the oxygen and sugars it needs to build its skeleton. The cooperation is so critical that when the algae are expelled, for example, when temperatures fluctuate too much, the coral loses its colors and source of energy and eventually can die. This phenomenon is known as coral bleaching. Corals also draw energy by feeding on tiny plankton suspended in the water. At the same time, corals are themselves food for fish, such as parrotfish and Picasso triggerfish. Corals grow in a range of shapes and forms. Massive corals that create huge balls where thousands of polyps close and open up at the appropriate time. Some resemble the human brain. But not all corals are rock hard. The skeleton of soft corals is different to that of stony corals. They exist in a range of colors, are more flexible, and can move from side to side in the water currents. Fire hydrocorals create dense zones on the reef. All corals have stinging cells for trapping prey, and it's especially painful to touch the stinging cells of the fire hydrocorals, which is what gives this coral its name. Like the corals, sea anemones also hunt their prey in the water body. The sea anemone is a large polyp attached to the reef's base. It has long hunting tentacles armed with stinging cells, also useful for staying safe. But this line of defense is not all. This sea anemone has backup. Like so many down here on the reef, it survives thanks to a crucial working partnership. Clownfish swim freely through its tentacles, immune to the sea anemone's stinging cells. The sea anemone provides the clownfish with protection and food, and in return receives its own protection and cleaning services. The fish's movement through its tentacles ensures a steady flow of oxygen-rich water. The sea anemone also enjoys the clownfish's secretion of ammonia that serves as a vital source of nitrogen. Two to six clownfish live with each sea anemone, organized in a clear hierarchy. A female heads the small group. She reproduces with a dominant male. If the female is eaten, her partner does something incredible. He becomes a female and takes her place. The next male in the hierarchy becomes her mate. The others will continue to wait their turn. During the breeding season, the female lays a mound of eggs near the sea anemone and the male fertilizes them. The two parents care for, clean and protect the eggs with dedication against predators such as the lionfish that searches for such a tasty meal. The sea anemone refuge is perfect for the clownfish and other fish find their home elsewhere. The cardinal fish hides among the spines of the sea urchin, well protected. But in the gulf, no refuge is completely safe. The Picasso triggerfish managed to reach this sea urchin, leaving behind only an empty spiny shell. Its eyes are located far from its mouth, which helps it avoid getting stabbed while it eats. The spectacular rasa also ate from the sea urchin and still carries an unwanted souvenir, this spine stuck in its face. With no partner to provide shelter, the hermit crab hauls its refuge wherever it goes. It needs to find abandoned shells like this one 
and will abandon it when it becomes too small to live in anymore. Partnerships are found all over the coral reef, but the mutual benefit is not always clear to the observer. Looking at the coral, a corpora, and the green reef chromis, the benefit to the fish is clear. They swim close to the coral, and when they need to, escape between its tough branches. But what does the coral gain from this partnership? The fish's nitrogen-rich secretions enrich the coral with essential nutrients. And with their waving fins, the chromis fish also ensure a flow of fresh, oxygen-rich water. Without this private school of fish, corals may suffer from oxygen deprivation at night. And there are some corals that are not satisfied by symbiosis with algae and fish. This Christmas tree worm grows inside this coral skeleton, a perfect place to settle upon and grow and enjoy the protection it offers from predators. In return, the worm provides the coral with a flow of oxygen-rich water and a safe growth platform for its polyps. A pipe organ sponge is also attached to the reef space. Sponges are one of the simplest and most ancient creatures in the oceans. Their body contains a complex network of openings, tunnels, and cavities lined with special cells which enable water to be pumped into their body. In this way, the sponges strain microscopic food particles from the water. Sponges are the reef's vacuum cleaners, cleaning its water from particles and maintaining the water's clarity. The giant clam also needs help down here and has developed a symbiotic relationship that enables it to reach its massive size. Like the corals, the clam works with algae that lives inside its tissues. They provide the clam with sugars. In return, the clam offers a comfortable home. In the Gulf of Eilat, the clam reaches 66 pounds. But beyond here in the great oceans, other clam species can grow to weigh 660 pounds and live up to 70 years. If the large animals need help, the small ones need it even more. This is the yellow-spotted boxfish. It spends the first part of its life in the same coral. Facing danger, it releases a toxic protein from its skin. The toxin can be fatal for fish that threaten it or its coral. And even before it goes on the attack, its bright yellow color sends a warning to all potential predators. I am toxic. When the boxfish matures, its color changes to blue-gray. Of course, in the Gulf of Eilat, some fish use tougher methods to stay alive. This moray eel searches for small fish and crustaceans. Despite its appearance, the moray eel is not a snake. It's actually a fish, and it's not poisonous. Many species of moray eel live in the Gulf of Eilat, in the seabed or in the reef's refuges. These fish are adapted to life beneath the surface. Their bodies have lengthened and lost all protrusions that might impede it from digging into the sand. This makes hunting a lot easier. To trap its prey, this snake eel digs into the ground and blocks any escape route to open water. The moray eel's body is covered by very thick skin. Some secrete sticky mucus that repels predators and shields them from bruising. The 
eel can open its mouth beyond the width of its own body, enabling it to swallow fish that weigh as much as a third of its body weight. The moray eel's sense of smell is so sensitive, it can detect prey dozens of feet away. Then it moves with frightening speed. Moray eels stick to a permanent area, returning home after each hunting trip. They find the red-backed cleaner shrimp waiting to take care of them. The cleaner shrimp moves over the moray eel, cleaning away dead tissue, parasites, and bits of food and dirt, even from inside its mouth. It's a win-win situation for both sides. The cleaner shrimp faces some competition, but it seems there's enough work for everyone. Next to the reef wall, a cleaner fish marks out his cleaning station with a welcome dance. Fish passing by approach the cleaning station and receive excellent service. Even the barracuda gets taken care of. Several species of cleaner fish live in the Gulf of Eilat. Each one carries out its work according to its size. A smaller cleaner fish enters the gill openings of a puffer fish. Sometimes the cleaning is annoying and the cleaner is dismissed. But not to worry, it will return at the earliest available opportunity. In one of the reef's alcoves, something secret is taking place. A groper approaches a moray eel and invites it to a joint hunting expedition. It moves its head in the eel's direction. This is the familiar signal. The moray eel accepts the invitation. This fascinating partnership is found between different species of gropers and moray eels in the Gulf. Each partner has a different role in the joint activity. The eel crawls ahead towards the reef crevices, while the grouper waits outside. Any prey fleeing the grouper for the reef refuge meets the eel. And those escaping from the eel are swallowed by the grouper. It turns out that hunting in tandem is five times more effective than hunting alone. How did this partnership form? Is it related only to instincts or does it indicate intelligence and learning by the fishes? Until it is solved by a future researcher, the answer will remain the predator's secret and the nightmare of the reef fish. Night falls on the Red Sea. It does not affect the water's temperature, but the darkness changes the balance of power. Sea creatures who were active during the day withdraw to the reef to sleep through the night. This is the hour of the night predators. A group of lionfish set out to hunt tiny glassfish.
The glass fish is small enough to be caught by tube corals. The transparent comb jelly, which resembles a jellyfish, is also active now. It moves in the water using tiny rows of lashes, searching for plankton in the water. At night, most corals spread out their hunting tentacles, waiting for prey. In the darkness, an extraordinary dancer bursts into action. The feather star may look like a plant, but it is an animal. Twenty species of feather star live in the Gulf of Elant. With open arms, it moves around the seabed or swims through the open water in search of food. The mouth is found in the upper part of their body, surrounded by feathery arms that strain tiny food particles and plankton floating in the water. The lower part of their body is equipped with special hooks for gripping onto rock protrusions or corals. Feather stars are very sensitive to light, and with perfect timing, they set out the moment darkness falls. Before sunrise, they return to the hidden reef labyrinth. At first light, in another corner of the reef, a strange journey takes place. A large octopus sets out, accompanied by a school of lionfish. These lionfish have learnt the value of joining a much bigger, powerful hunter. They swim alongside the octopus like backup forces, primed and ready to steal any leftovers or a fingerling that escaped the hunting net. Other fish gather and join the large hunters, waiting for a forgotten crumb. The octopus hunts the small fingerlings relying on the coral to save them. It spreads out its body like a fishing net, covering the entire coral. The octopus hunts all over the reef, but prefers the coral canyons and the seagrass meadows. Seagrass meadows resemble the broad savanna plains, home to herds of grazers, chased and threatened by predators. Large sea turtles swim here. Fish graze among algae and plants, aware of every movement or shadow. In these open grazing meadows, danger is everywhere. Speed and camouflage are the name of the game. At the edge of the reef, the seagrass covers a large area that looks like a lawn. It is not seaweed, but a more complex plant with flowers that migrated millions of years ago from dry land to the sea. 
The seagrass lives in partnership with bacteria, which take gaseous nitrogen dissolved in the water and convert it into organic forms, useful for the reef's organism. These plants and their associated bacteria play a fundamentally important role in the food web. Only a few plants in the world, including seagrasses and acacia trees on land, have associated bacteria that can trap gaseous nitrogen and make it accessible to living organisms, which use it to build proteins. In contrast to the many places around the world where reefs have formed, the reef in the Gulf of Eilat grows on the edge of a desert environment, surrounded by arid mountain ranges. Herds of gazelles and ibex have managed to survive in this harsh, dry land. These surface animals owe their survival to the acacia tree, their primary source of food. The acacia strap flower grows on the trunk and blossoms nearly all year round. It conducts photosynthesis, but it also draws fluids and all of its essential nutrients from the tree itself. With so few insects in the desert, the acacia strap flower needs birds to carry out pollination and the scattering of seeds. This is able to happen because the flower's vibrant red attracts sunbirds and other songbirds, and these partners transfer the sticky seeds to other trees. Is the acacia tree and the acacia strap relationship a partnership or parasitism? It's still not clear. Another relationship that takes place under the scorching sun also looks like parasitism. The desert broom rape rises up and flowers from the arid soil in strong patches of yellow. It has no green leaves and so does not conduct photosynthesis. In order to survive, it has evolved to take advantage of other plants. The broom rape's roots are deeply entwined in the root system of a salt bush. The desert broom rape feeds off the salt bush and flowers at its expense. Neither the salt bush nor the acacia tree appears to be gaining anything from the partnership forced upon it. The acacia tree is an entire world. At any hour during the day, desert creatures come to rest in its shade or eat from it. In the hot noon hours, something that looks like a prehistoric dinosaur comes in close. The Egyptian mastigur, the largest lizard in Israel, weighs up to 6.5 pounds and can reach 2.5 feet in length. It looks threatening, armed with a large spiny tail that it whips to ward off threats. The Egyptian mastigur stands guard at the entrance of its burrow. From here, it looks out in all directions while warming up in the sun. In the morning, its colors are darker. Dark colors warm up rapidly. Only during the noon hours, when its body reaches a high temperature, is it ready for action. Then its color lightens to the dusty shade of the environment. The adult is completely herbivorous, eating from acacia trees and gathering flowers and seeds at the base. At times of danger, it escapes to its burrow. Each Egyptian mastigure guards a territory around its burrow and around its own acacia tree. At night, when the temperature drops, it returns home. This is when the nocturnal desert snakes set out. In our imagination, cobras belong to moist, green, tropical forests. But an impressive member of this family lives here in the desert. And the black desert cobra is one of the most dangerous snakes in the entire country. Guided by its keen sense of smell, it slithers among the rocks, searching for toads, rodents, and reptiles. 
And when it finds its quarry, the cobra swallows it whole. When the cobra feels threatened, it hisses loudly with surprising aggression. This cobra is here to stay. The rising sun drives the snakes away to their shady refuges and reveals the beauty of the Timna Valley. Ancient limestone cliffs rising to great heights, sculpted and weathered by wind and water, broad arid channels and sparse scattered vegetation create a colorful and surreal landscape. On the edges of the valley grow rare dome palms. Originally from the extremely arid regions of eastern Africa and the Nile Valley, this is their northernmost location in the world. Compared to other palms growing from a single trunk, the dome palm boasts a unique branch trunk. When the temperature in the river valley surrounding the gulf exceeds 104 degrees Fahrenheit, ornate mastigures are the only creatures which wander the landscape. The ornate mastigure is smaller and more colorful than its Egyptian cousin, which lives on the open plains. The ornate mastigure lives in steep canyons and rocky areas. It feeds off desert shrubs and their fruit. The sweet, succulent offerings from the tiley weed are a real delicacy and provide the mastigure with all the water it needs. There is no mistaking the male ornate mastigure which is yellow, blue, and green, and the female, which is camouflaged in brown. Mastigures are attractive to predators and must protect themselves. When it notices the eagle, the ornate mastigure squeezes between rocks or into a shady crevice and disappears from sight, thanks to its color and skin pattern. Camouflage is critical here, and it's not exclusive to surface creatures. On the sandy seabed, out in the open, there are no rocky refuges to hide in, and animals rely on camouflage to survive. The sole has evolved to become completely flat. This allows it to dig in and camouflage itself in sand. Only its two eyes protrude above. Equipped with a similar survival tactic, Pegasus draconis looks exactly like sand. Down here, hiding is not the only line of defense. Some fish can go on the attack if they need to. Like their shark relatives, stingrays do not have bones. Their skeletal structure consists of hard but flexible cartilage. The blue-spotted ribbon-tail ray lies in the sand during the day, covered so that only its eyes are visible. But it cannot see its prey. The hidden hunter locates crabs, clams, and mollusks using its excellent sense of smell and electric receptors and cracks them with its strong teeth. Its main predators are sharks, but its tail is armed with a poisonous spine. 
the stingray does not hesitate to thrust it into a threat. This scorpion fish was nicknamed Walkman because of its ability to walk on the sandy seabed. Completely camouflaged, it looks just like a rock covered in seaweed. Its entire body is shielded by bumps and highly toxic spines. Its camouflage is so convincing that it can simply lie quietly in wait and then ambush a passing fish. When hunting, it opens its large mouth rapidly and sucks in its surprised prey. Speckled shrimpfish look like branches and swim in a head down, tail up position. Well hidden among the branches of the black coral that is their background. Some don't require camouflage and boast vibrant colors. Various species of sea slugs creep along the sand, each one with its own psychedelic pattern and color. Their gills flap on their backs like a flower, enabling them to breathe the oxygen in the water. Sea slugs prey on poisonous organisms like sponges and absorb the poisons in their bodies. These chemical compounds make them very unappealing to potential predators and compensate for the evolutionary loss of their shell. They advertise their toxicity with an array of warning colors and crawl along the sand without a worry. Most predators do not dare to touch them. In the open sandy area, far from the reef, strong water currents whip up the plankton floating in the water. The upright garden eel knows exactly how to exploit this abundant food. The eels hide away, each one in its burrow, in dense colonies. And as if some instant message was passed around, they emerge one after the other in quick succession. To prepare for feeding, they hang upright in the current, while the other end of their body is firmly anchored in their sandy burrow. And then it's dinner time. Any passing movement or shadow causes them to escape rapidly into their burrows. Among the sandy patches and seagrass meadows, hidden from the eye, live pipefish and their relatives, the seahorses. They are so well camouflaged, it is difficult to detect them. They feed on little organisms, sucking them up with their long, narrow, toothless mouths. But for all these different vanishing acts around the reef, the master of camouflage and variation remains the octopus. Lacking a skeleton, it can squeeze into incredibly narrow crevices. And it can swim backwards by creating a powerful water jet.
The octopus's supple body discards and assumes multiple shapes and textures, sometimes smooth and pale, other times bumpy and speckled. Its skin contains pigment cells that allow it to change colors according to the surroundings or message it wants to convey. When hunting, it uses its eight tentacles armed with strong suction cups to hold its prey. During the mating period, the male octopus guards his female partner aggressively, expelling other male quarters from its territory. Here he holds one of her tentacles and pulls her into a nearby hiding place, far from competitors. Another inhabitant of the seabed is the sea cucumber, which crawls slowly along the sand using tiny hydraulic tube feet. Special legs surrounding its mouth gather up sand. It swallows a large amount of sand through its mouth, sifts out the organic matter, and excretes the sand pellets at the other end of its body. In order to survive the underwater jungle, finding a reliable, secure refuge is essential. Some search for solid objects to grab and settle on. Rocks or other protruding objects can become an anchor for life. In 1994, a decommissioned ship was sunk off the coast of Eilat to serve as an artificial reef. Within a short period of time, the first settlers had clung to its walls. And after 20 years, it had become a well-developed, rich reef and spectacular diving site. Today, efforts are being made around the world to support coral reefs with the help of man-made foundations. These artificial structures create new diving sites and help to divert divers away from natural reefs, thus reducing environmental stresses on these delicate worlds. Next to the ship's wall, above a sandy area, a school of squid swim past. Their tentacles are a direct extension of their heads, perfect for hunting. Group living gives the squid a better chance for survival, especially for creatures that are easy prey. In a dense school, there's always a chance that someone else will be eaten. Swimming fast helps. So does swimming at the center of the group and not at the edges. The sea goldie also lives in dense schools, staying close to the reef for safety. The school comprises several groups or harems, which include a purple-colored territorial male and several bright orange-colored females. The females swim above an area of coral that is divided between the males. During the mating season, the male releases sperm cells into the water and the females release egg cells. Only females develop from the fertilized eggs and they eventually join the harem. When the male dies, a large dominant female changes her sex to male and takes his place.
after the sex change, there is no way back, and the female functions as a male in all senses of the word. Many other species have developed the strategy of living in schools, searching for food together, and protecting each other from predators. These schools appear to move like one big organism. Especially when they escape threats with a single unified movement. There is more to it than meets the eye. Delving deeper into these social and survival patterns reveals a complex mosaic full of surprising relationships, dependencies, and partnerships between different species and between individuals of the same species. The coral reef is a supreme example of this living, evolving mosaic that we have only just begun to explore and understand. <laughs>